Hello and welcome to Matt Mojo, and today we're going to be counting down the top 10 movies I watched for the first time during the month of July 2021. This list won't be strictly limited to movies that were released during the month, it's any movie that I've never seen before that I finally watched for the first time. I won't be including any short films, documentaries, or films I've seen before. Compared to last month, the amount of new movies that I watched this time went down really badly. Last month, I watched 47 films for the first time, and now, sadly, I have only watched 22 new films. So basically, almost half of them will make the list. I mean, this wasn't bad. I actually really enjoyed this action-packed time travel suspense horror. So I guess the plot was that time travelers from the future start recruiting people from the past in order to fight against a ravaging species of aliens. Of course, Chris Pratt is a controversial figure, but other than that, the performances weren't really much to talk about in the film. It was pretty standard from all of them. It doesn't mean that they were all bad, they were all just good at their jobs, but it wasn't really a character driven story. The visual effects were actually pretty good in this film, especially one shot near the end of a sort of oil rig exploding in slow motion was probably a great piece of art. I don't know if it's just me, but it felt like a renaissance painting. Also the message the film has about climate change was surprising, yet totally reasonable. It kind of made the movie more enjoyable and allowed it to stick with me even more than most other action movies like this would. I haven't watched the other two yet, but I am hoping they are as good as this one. Set in 1994, as said in the title, a bunch of teenagers from Shadyside must fight off the evil curse left from a witch from 1666. This is the first part of a trilogy that released each film within a week of each other, which is a new and an interesting release model. This is your typical slasher flick that is very reminiscent of your classics such as Friday the 13th and Texas Chainsaw Massacre, among others. It is actually surprisingly good for a slasher film of its kind. I feel like it's meant to be fun and stupid and that's exactly how I felt about it after watching, which is exactly what I needed. The film is also inventive at times, especially involving a bread cutter I think it is. That one scene will probably live with me forever and that proves that this movie was memorable. Before, I was only familiar with the musical adaptation of this film, but now I'm very glad I watched the original. Seymour, a skid row florist, grows a strange and unusual man-eating plant. Even without the music, this movie proved that the story alone is entertaining and intriguing to watch. It's hilarious and full of campiness, which makes it enjoyable. Even though it is a horror film technically, it has many comedic beats and elements to it to make it stand out. I especially love that the plant reveals the faces of the people that have been eaten because it truly adds to the suspense and the crime aspects to the film. Listen, I am a huge fan of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. WandaVision is my actual most favorite show of all time, I swear, but this movie was not at that level. A prequel, Black Widow, goes off on a side mission that reunites her family to defeat the evil legion that corrupts other Black Widows. Starting off with the bad, this movie has the Wonder Woman 1984 and Shazam problem of being such a side mission that doesn't add much to the MCU as a whole, which makes it not as necessary necessary to watch. Also, the last third of the movie completely lost my attention. At first, there was a lot of talking that made me tune out a bit and then the final battle scene seemed to be such a CGI nightmare. But with the good stuff, the first two thirds of the movie were actually really good. It was your typical Marvel action movie which is not bad at all. The comedy was on point and the white costumes for Natasha and Yelena look great. David Harbour and Florence Pugh's comedy in particular were standout. Scarlett Johansson Hansen, of course, does a great job in the film. I mean, of course she does. She's been playing the character for like 10 years now. I also think that the theme and message about child and woman trafficking is very key to this film. It brings awareness to the issue and is an important discussion to have. Nicole is suffering from terminal cancer and does not have much more time to live, so her and her husband Matthew bring in their best friend Dane to help with the process. This is the kind of film that feels along the same lines of Together Together or Fatherhood. All three are smaller scale films that rely on character and character dynamics and story rather than flashiness, and I feel like this is slowly becoming one of my most favorite genres. All three leads, Dakota Johnson, Casey Affleck, and especially John Siegel, 
are in their elements and prove their acting skills here. The chemistry between all three of them blend together so well and you could really feel the love that each one has for one another. It also helps that there is such a strong script to bolster their character performances. Even if the script is formatted in a non-linear fashion, it is still very easy to follow the story as more and more gets revealed about all of their histories and past relationships. A doctor and her brother team up with a Jungle Cruise tour guide down the Amazon River in order to find an ancient tree that I think can generate youth or healing, I'm not too sure. This movie is actually surprisingly very very fun. You already know I have a huge fear of every single animal so it wasn't enjoyable to me whenever a creature was on screen but other than that I was just having a good time. The chemistry between Dwayne The Rock Johnson and Emily Blunt is perfect and they were the correct duo for their roles. I never thought that they would work so well together, but they proved me wrong. Jack Whitehall also gives a hilarious performance that for some reason is not really getting promoted, but should be. He does a great job. They all do a great job, and I would definitely like to see a sequel to this film because there are so many adventures I would like to see this trio go on together. Maybe a Disney Plus series would be phenomenal. I would also like to see more Disney movies based off of attractions. I'm a big fan of the Disney parks and so movies based on properties like Space Mountain or Big Thunder Mountain Railroad would be very interesting to me. Speaking of a good time, this movie is the definition of good vibes only, I swear. Barb and Star are best friends from a small town who decide to shake things up and go to Vista Del Mar to live their vacation of their dreams. On their trip, they find themselves stuck in a secret spy mission to stop the dangers of an evil scientist. From the plot alone, the movie sounds incredibly generic and so stupid, and that's because it is. But that is also what makes it so enjoyable. Honestly, the first 15 minutes of the movie, I felt like like I was going to hate it. I thought Barb and Star were so annoying and I could not take it. But I kept watching and wow did they grow on me. Their happiness is what I aspire to be and they just really lift up my mood. This is one of the most fun movies of the year and I really mean it. Based on a Twitter thread, Zola follows two girls as they are trapped into the world of sex trafficking as they struggle to escape. I know that the plot seems really dark the way I described it, but it is genuinely one of the funniest movies I have ever seen. The editing style is incredibly unique and something I have never seen before, and that's what makes it really stand out. Also with a fantastic leading performance from Taylor Page, she really stands out and makes her name known. I could see a lot more from her in the future, I hope so. Especially given the the fact that this movie is so rooted in social media and modern technology, it's refreshing to see it portrayed in a not overly annoying way. Technology advances the plot, and I know that it's because it's based on a true story, it just doesn't feel annoying. Also, one of the best parts of the movie is when the perspective shift happens, and I don't want to give too much away to those who haven't watched it, but that scene is so unexpected yet so welcome. I know that this movie is a classic, but I finally got around to watching it. I mean, everyone knows the plot. There's a beach full of people and all of a sudden a shark comes out and ruins their 4th of July vacation. Like I said during Jungle Cruise, I am so afraid of animals, especially sharks, and so that really helped this movie be scary for me. The action is intense and the horror scenes are thrilling and leave me on the edge of my seat the whole time. I hate how the people in this movie brush it off as nothing and continue going on to the beach even with the warnings but after the events of the past year it now makes sense how this is totally realistic people are dumb but jaws is such a fun summer movie and really excels at its horror aspects especially considering the time it came out I don't know why, but I just for some reason really enjoyed this movie. Ingrid recently lost all of her friends, so as a ploy to make them all jealous on social media, she moves to LA in order to befriend the perfect Taylor and copy her social media lifestyle. Like Zola, it's another social media based movie except this time it's annoying, which is how it's supposed to be portrayed. I think Ingrid Goes West is a fantastic exposition into the dangers of social media and the harmful repercussions it has on depression and mental illness. 
That sounds pretty deep, but it's also a fantastically comedic film that hits all of its beats perfectly. There is such a nice, fair balance between comedy and conflict in this film, and it is excellently paced. I'm honestly pretty surprised that this movie made it to number one on my list, but here we are. I know I barely cover the TV shows I watch, but I watched a surprising amount of shows this past month, and I want to mention all of them. But if I did a full review of each one of them, that would take forever, so instead, I'll just do a speed round and they will be talked about at a random order. I never watched the original Gossip Girl, but this one seems interesting with a diverse cast and an overall melodramatic plot for teens, but that's why I keep watching. The limited series so far has been character introduction and establishing the relationships between each one of them, but the tension just keeps growing and growing better. This is a surprisingly good show with great voice work from Ben Feldman and Mindy Kaling and reminds me of the old Disney Channel shows I grew up watching like The Little Mermaid the series, Emperor's New School, or Buzz Lightyear's Star Command. A great comedy that explores the dynamic relationship of two comedians from different generations as they attempt to meet in the middle and learn the art of compromise and cooperation. To be honest, this is my least favorite Disney Plus Marvel show, but that's just because I didn't really understand what was going on the whole time, but I still enjoyed it. I think I already mentioned this show last month, but more episodes keep coming out and I wake up the members of my nation every week just to watch this. Although Aaron Tveit's makeup is overly done, which I also think is the point of it, this is actually a really funny musical comedy series that is borderline annoying, but what do you expect from musical theater? This show was robbed of a Best Comedy Series Emmy nomination, and I hate that it is genuinely genuinely slept on by everyone because this has become one of my classics. Surprisingly, this is on the same level as other fantastic crime TV shows like Criminal Minds or Hawaii Five-0 except add Josh Peck's style of humor and it becomes not as grim but a very good time. I watched a bunch of completely random episodes of her show but it is so addicting to see her contacting the spirits even if it's real or not. I think the first two episodes were great, the third was questionable but the fourth one was rough. Either way, I'm still having fun and enjoying the show and all, and I would love if Ryan Murphy hired me. I don't care what it would be for, American Horror Story Season 13, Glee 2, it doesn't matter to me, I just want to work with you. Continuing on with the greatness of the first season, the second season so far has matched its level in comedy and maturity, and I am hopeful for its Emmy chances. I love Disneyland attractions and theme parks in general, so this is the perfect show for me. To be honest, I still like the Imagineering story more, which is very similar in concept, but this one is still great and goes deep into the individual attractions. I completely forgot how intense this show was, but it is still super fun and crazy and I really like the addition of Stormfront into the cast. Lastly, this show is so great for Asian representation in the superhero genre and the plot really hooked me into its story, especially with the conflicting father-son dynamic. Anyway, those are the top 10 movies and 15 shows I watched for the first time in July 2021. Across the screen, you should be seeing a bunch of films fading in and out of those that didn't make the top 10 this month. Some were good and some were really bad, but you can just check out my letterbox to see my reviews and ratings of those.